From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything. But I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly have the authorities to, to wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president, if I had a personal email. Edward Snowden the whistleblower behind the new explosive revelations about the National Security Agency and the U.S. surveillance state. Three weeks ago, the 29-year-old left his job working inside the NSA's office in Hawaii, where he worked for the private intelligence firm Booz Allen Hamilton. Today, he's in Hong Kong, not sure if he'll ever see his home again. It's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with, and attack you on that basis to sort of derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrongdoer. We will air an interview with NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, then speak to Glenn Greenwald, the Guardian columnist who broke the NSA surveillance stories, and will be joined by another NSA whistleblower, William Binney. He spent almost 40 years at the agency, but resigned after September 11th over growing domestic surveillance. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A former CIA employee working as a contractor for the National Security Agency has come forward as the source behind one of the biggest leaks in U.S. history. Edward Snowden, a former CIA technical assistant now working with the NSA through the military firm Booz Allen Hamilton, revealed his identity in an interview with The Guardian of London. Snowden said he exposed top-secret NSA surveillance programs programs to alert Americans of expansive government spying on innocents. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. Snowden was speaking from Hong Kong, where he's been since last month after leaving his home in Hawaii. He says he carefully vetted each document that he released to ensure it was, quote, legitimately in the public interest. Over the last several days, Snowden's disclosures to The Guardian and The Washington Post have revealed a number of previously unknown surveillance operations carried out by the NSA. These include the collection of millions of U.S. call logs and a secret program called PRISM that gathers data on foreign Internet users from the servers of nine major firms, including Google, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo and Facebook. Other disclosures include a presidential directive laying out the guidelines for launching cyber attacks and a data mining tool called Boundless Informant that details U.S. surveillance on computer and telephone networks abroad. The National Security Agency has asked the Justice Department to begin a criminal probe into the leaks. On Sunday, the chairs of both the Congressional Intelligence Committees, Congressmember Mike Rogers and Senator Di Feinstein, said the whistleblower involved should face prosecution. Speaking to NBC News, the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, said the leak has done grave damage. For me, it is uh, literally, uh, not figuratively, literally gut-wrenching to see this happen uh, because of the huge, grave damage it does to our uh, intelligence capabilities. The White House is expected to make its first comments today on Edward Snowden's coming forward as the NSA whistleblower. Snowden had been staying in the same Hong Kong hotel for the past three weeks, but he reportedly checked out earlier today. In its article disclosing his identity, The Guardian of London writes, quote, Edward Snowden will go down in history as one of America's most consequential whistleblowers, alongside Daniel Ellsberg and Bradley Manning, they wrote. 
We'll have more on NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden and his surveillance revelations after headlines. As Snowden revealed his identity from Hong Kong, President Obama wrapped up a two-day summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping in California. Outgoing National Security Advisor Tom Donilon said Obama confronted his Chinese counterpart on U.S. allegations of China-based cyberspiracy. The specific issue uh, that President Obama talked to President Xi about today uh, is the issue of cyber-enabled uh, uh, economic theft, theft of uh, uh, intellectual property uh, and other kinds of property uh, in the public and private realm uh, in the United States by entities uh, uh, based in China. Uh, if there continues to be this direct theft um, of the United States property, that this was going to be a very difficult problem in the economic relationship and was going to be an inhibitor, inhibitor to the relationship really reaching its full potential. That's National Security Advisor Tom Donilon talking about cyber piracy. In response to the cyber theft complaints, Chinese President Xi said the U.S. has failed to properly address cyber attacks against China. Both sides, however, announced they reached common ground on seeking the denuclearization of North Korea. On the issue of climate change, the two leaders agreed to work jointly on reducing HFCs, the potent greenhouse gases used in air conditioners and refrigerators. The White House says the U.S. and China has reached a framework that could reduce up to a year's worth of current greenhouse gas emissions. Pakistan has lodged a formal complaint after a U.S. drone strike that killed nine people. A Pakistani government spokesperson said U.S. envoy Richard Hoagland was summoned to Pakistan's foreign ministry over the weekend. Given the fact that this drone strike is uh, taking place after the installation of the new government, uh, the importance of the, this particular protest can be gauged from the fact that the Prime Minister himself gave, gave the instruction, and uh, this was delivered at a very high level. And we do hope that the U.S. government would, uh, would uh, see merit in, uh, uh, in the protest that government of Pakistan has lodged and the argument that we are making that this uh, is counterproductive and uh, violates our sovereignty. Friday's drone strike hit a compound in the tribal region of North Waziristan. It was the first since last week's inauguration of the new Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. In his opening address to lawmakers, Sharif had called for an end to U.S. drone attacks on Pakistani soil. This daily business of drones has to stop immediately. Other countries must respect our sovereignty and address our concerns as we respect their sovereignty. A Taliban assault on Afghanistan's main international airport in Kabul has ended with all seven attackers dead. Two were suicide bombers, while the rest were gunmen shot dead by Afghan government forces. The attack came one day after an Afghan soldier shot dead three Americans, two soldiers and a civilian in an eastern province. It was the latest in a series of so-called insider attacks by members of the Afghan forces on the U.S.-led NATO occupation. Tens of thousands rallied in Turkey Sunday in the largest anti-government protest since unrest broke out two weeks ago. The movement began as an effort to block the raising of a public park, but has since grown into challenging Turkish Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan for what opponents call excessively religious and authoritarian tendencies. The largest crowd Sunday filled Istanbul's Taksim Square, with thousands more in the capital Ankara and the western city of Izmir. Police dispersed the Ankara protests with tear gas and water cannons. Erdogan, meanwhile, addressed a counter-rally of thousands of supporters upon his return from a foreign trip. Erdogan said his patience is wearing thin with the opposition protests and called for more pro-government rallies next weekend. Former South African President Nelson Mandela has been hospitalized and remains in what's being described as serious but stable condition. It's Mandela's fourth trip to the hospital since December for a recurring lung infection. The former South African president is 94 years old. 
The Senate is beginning debate on the bipartisan immigration reform bill that would establish a path to citizenship for millions of undocumented immigrants while radically expanding border enforcement. In a boost to the bill's chances of hitting the 60-vote threshold, Republican Senator Kelly Ayotte announced her endorsement on Sunday. On the eve of the Senate debate last week, the Republican-controlled House passed a measure to resume the deportation of hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. President Obama granted them a reprieve under an order last year. Six people are dead after Friday's shooting rampage in Santa Monica, California. The suspect, John Zawari, reportedly set fire to his family's home and shot dead his father and brother. Police say he then hijacked a car and opened fire on the campus of Santa Monica College, killing three others. Several other people were also wounded. Zawari was armed with an AR-15 assault rifle, an automatic weapon similar to what was used in the Newtown School massacre. Santa Monica Police Chief Jacqueline and Seabrook said police recovered more than 1,300 rounds of ammunition. If all of the magazines that we collected were, um, in fact, loaded fully, uh, something in the order of about 1,300 rounds, and that's an estimation, 1,300 rounds uh, could have been fired had there not been an interdiction and that person neutralized at an appropriate time. I would presume that any time someone puts on a vest of some sort, uh, comes out with a bag full of full, uh, loaded magazines, has an extra receiver, has a handgun, um, and has a semi-automatic rifle, carjacks folks, goes to a college, kills more people, uh, and has to be neutralized at the hands of the police, I would say that that's premeditated. John Zawari was killed on the campus by police. The annual meeting of the retail giant Walmart was held in Arkansas Friday amidst protests from activists and striking workers. Around 100 Walmart workers took part in a national caravan to protest what they alleged to be illegal retaliation against those seeking to change company practices on wages and worker security and unions. Inside the meeting, shareholders and their proxies were offered a brief window to present non-binding resolutions. The measures were all defeated because the founding Walton family still owns more than half the company's stock. Kalpona Akhtar, a workers' rights activist from Bangladesh, urged Walmart to stop rejecting new safety standards proposed in the aftermath of the Dhaka building collapse that killed over 1,100 Bangladeshi workers in April. Janet Sparks, a Louisiana Walmart employee and member of the group Our Walmart, drew applause from the crowd of thousands, including many of her colleagues, when she raised the plight of struggling U.S. workers and criticized CEO Mike Duke's $20.7 million paycheck. Or tough for many of our customers. But I want you to know that times are tough for many Walmart associates, too. We are stretching our paychecks to pay our bills and support our families. So when I think about the fact that our CEO, Mike Duke, made over $20 million last year, more than 1,000 times the average Walmart associate. With all due respect, I have to say, I don't think that's right. Although some activists made it inside the meeting, a number were kept away after Walmart won restraining orders against protesters and labor groups. California's troubled San Onofre nuclear plant is shutting down for good. It's been idle for over a year following a radioactive leak. The leak led to the discovery of excessive wear and tubing that carries radioactive water. The plant's operator, Southern California Edison, had maintained it wanted to restart the reactors, but on Friday announced the plant would be permanently closed. In a statement, the environmentalist group Friends of the Earth welcomed the news, saying, quote, the people of California now have the opportunity to move away from the failed promise of dirty and dangerous nuclear power and replace it with the safe and clean energy provided by the sun and the wind. And jury selection begins today in the murder trial of George Zimmerman, the Florida man who shot and killed unarmed black teenager Trayvon Martin last year. Zimmerman faces up to life in prison on charges of second-degree murder. 
And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We turn now to the man who blew the whistle on the National Security Agency and the expanding U.S. surveillance state. On Sunday, The Guardian newspaper revealed the source of its explosive series on the NSA to be a 29-year-old former CIA technical assistant named Edward Snowden. For the past four years, Snowden's been working at the NSA as an employee of various outside contractors, including Booz Allen Hamilton and Dell. Most recently, he was working at the NSA office in Hawaii. On May 20th, he boarded a plane bound for Hong Kong, where he's remained ever since. Since Wednesday, The Guardian has published a series of articles based on information provided by Snowden. First, The Guardian revealed the National Security Agency is collecting telephone records of millions of Verizon customers under a secret court order issued in April. Then, The Guardian revealed the existence of a top-secret program codenamed PRISM, where the NSA obtained access to the central servers of nine major Internet companies, including Google, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo and Facebook. Then on Friday, The Guardian exposed how President Obama had ordered his senior national security and intelligence officials to draw up a list of potential overseas targets for U.S. cyber attacks. And then The Guardian revealed details about an NSA data mining tool called Boundless Informant that details and even maps by country the voluminous amount of information it collects from computer and telephone networks. A top-secret NSA global heat map shows that in March 2013, the agency collected 97 billion pieces of intelligence from computer networks worldwide. The NSA most frequently targeted Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Egypt and India. The boundless informant documents also showed the agency collected almost 3 billion pieces of intelligence from U.S. computer networks over a 30-day period, ending in March of 2013. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald, who's written these exposés. But first, let's turn to NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden in his own words. He recently sat down with Glenn Greenwald to talk about why he leaked the documents and why he's revealing his identity. The interview was filmed by Laura Poitras. It was filmed in Hong Kong. It was posted on The Guardian website on Sunday. My name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. What are some of the positions that you held previously within the intelligence community? Uh, I've been uh, a systems engineer, systems administrator. Uh, senior advisor uh, for the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, solutions consultant, and a uh, telecommunications information systems officer. One of the things people are going to be most interested in, 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 in trying to understand what who you are and, and what you're thinking, is there came some point in time when you crossed this line of thinking about being a whistleblower um, to making the choice to actually become a whistleblower. Walk people through that decision-making process. Uh, when you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, you're exposed to a lot more information on a broader scale than the average employee. And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Uh, when you see everything, you see them on a more frequent basis, and you recognize that some of these things are actually abuses. And when you talk to people about them uh, in a place like this, where this is the, the normal state of business, people tend not to take them very seriously and you know move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up, and you feel compelled to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you're ignored, the more you're told it's not a problem. Until eventually you realize that uh, these things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who was simply hired by the government. Talk a little bit about how the American surveillance state actually functions. It are, does it target the actions of Americans? Uh, NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can, by any means possible, that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, 
originally we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now increasingly we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically, targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, be intending to uh, target someone associated with a foreign government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything, but I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly have the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. One of the extraordinary parts about this episode is that usually whistleblowers do what they do anonymously and take steps to remain anonymous for as long as they can, which they hope often is forever. You, on the other hand, have decided to do the opposite, which is to declare yourself openly as the person behind these disclosures. Why did you choose to do that? I, I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. When you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And if you do that in secret consistently, you know, as the government does uh, when it wants to benefit from a secret action that it took, uh, it'll kind of give its, its officials a mandate to go, hey, you know, tell the press about this thing and that thing so the public is on our side. But they rarely, if ever, do that when an abuse occurs. That falls to uh, individual citizens, but they're typically maligned. You know, it, it becomes a thing of these people are against the country, they're against the government, but I'm not. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. Have you given thought to what it is that the U.S. government's response to your conduct is in terms of what they might say about you, how they might try to depict you, what they might try to do to you? Uh, yeah, I, I could be you know rendered by the CIA. I, I could have uh, people come after me or any of their, their third-party partners. Uh, you know, they, they work closely with a number of other nations. Uh, or, you know, they, they could pay off the triads or, you know, any, any of their agents or assets. Uh, we've, we've got a CIA station just up the road in the, the, the consulate here in Hong Kong, uh, and I'm sure they're going to be uh, very busy for the next week. Um, and that's, that's a, a fear I live under for the rest of my life, however long that happens to be. You, you can't come forward against the world's most powerful intelligence agencies and uh, be completely free from risk because they're such powerful adversaries that, that no one can meaningfully oppose them. Um, if they want to get you, they'll get you in time. But at the same time, you have to make a determination about what it is that's important to you. And if living, uh, living unfreely but comfortably is something you're willing to accept, and I think many of us are, it's, it's the human nature, uh, you can get up every day, you can go to work, you can collect your, your large paycheck for relatively little work uh, against the public interest and, and go to sleep at night after watching uh, your shows. But... If you realize that that's the world that you helped create, and it's going to get worse with the next generation and the next generation who extend the capabilities of this sort of architecture of oppression, uh, you realize that you might be willing to accept any risk, and it doesn't matter what the outcome is so long as the public gets to make their own decisions about how that's applied. Why should people care about surveillance? Because even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. And the, the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude. 
uh, to where it's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with, and attack you on that basis to sort of derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrongdoer. We are currently sitting in a room in, in Hong Kong, which is where we are because you traveled here. Talk a little bit about why it is that you came here. And specifically, there are going to be people who will speculate um, that what you really intend to do is to defect to the country that many see as the number one rival of the United States, which is China, and that what you're really doing is essentially seeking to aid an enemy of the United States with which you intend to um, seek asylum. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there, there's a couple uh, assertions in, in those arguments um, that, are, that are sort of embedded in the, the questioning of the choice of Hong Kong. Uh, the first is that China is an enemy of the United States. It, it's not. I mean, there there are conflicts between the United States government and the Chinese uh, PRC government, but the the peoples inherently, you know, we we don't care. We trade with each other freely. You know, we're not at war. We're not uh, in armed conflict, and we're not trying to be. We're we're the largest trading partners out there for each other. Um, uh, additionally, Hong Kong. Uh, has a strong tradition of free speech. Uh, people think, oh, China, great firewall. Mainland China does have significant restrictions uh, on free speech, but uh, the Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong, uh, have a long tradition of protesting in the streets, of making their views known. The internet is not filtered here. Um, no more so than any other Western government. And I believe that the uh, Hong Kong government is actually independent uh, in relation to a lot of other leading Western governments. If your motive had been to harm the United States and help its enemies, or if your motive had been personal material gain, were there things that you could have done with these documents um, to advance those goals that you didn't end up doing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, anybody in the positions of access with the te technical uh, capabilities that I had could, you know, suck out secrets, pass them on the open market to Russia. You know, they always have an open door, as we do. Um, I had access to, you know, the, the full rosters of everyone working at the NSA, the entire intelligence community, uh, and undercover assets all around the world, uh, the locations of every station uh, we have, what their missions are, and so forth. Uh, if I had just wanted to harm the U.S., you know, that you could shut down the, the surveillance system in an afternoon. Um, but that's not my intention. And I, I think for anyone um, making that argument, they need to think, if they were in my position, uh, and, and you know, you live a privileged life, you, you're living in Hawaii, in, in paradise, and making a ton of money, what would it take to make you leave everything behind? The, the greatest fear that I have regarding um, the outcome uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. Um, people will see in the media uh, all of these disclosures. They'll know the lengths that the, the government is going to grant themselves powers unilaterally um, to create greater control over American society and global society. But they, they won't be willing to take the risks necessarily to stand up and fight to change things, to force their representatives to actually take a stand in their interests. Uh, and the months ahead, the, the years ahead, it's only going to get worse until eventually there will be a time where uh, policies will change because the only thing that restricts the activities of the surveillance state are policy. Uh, even our agreements with, with other sovereign governments, we consider that to be uh, a stipulation of policy rather than a stipulation of law. And because of that, a new leader will be elected. They'll flip the switch, uh, say that um, because of the crisis because of the dangers that we face in the world, you know, some, some new and unpredicted threat, we need more authority. We need more power. And there will be nothing the people can do at that point to oppose it. Uh, and it will be turnkey tyranny.
NSA whistleblower Ed Snowden being interviewed by The Guardian's Glenn Greenwald. The interview was filmed by award-winning documentary filmmaker Laura Poitras in Snowden's Hong Kong hotel room on June 6. Edward Snowden left the U.S. for Hong Kong on May 20th, has been there since. When we come back, we'll be joined by Glenn Greenwald from Hong Kong and then NSA whistleblower William Binney. Stay with us. Activists and songwriter Dave Littman. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. To talk more about the National Security Agency, we're joined by Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald from Hong Kong, where he's broken a series of articles about the NSA over the past week based on information provided by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. He conducted the interview with Snowden that we just aired. Since we last spoke to Glenn on Friday, he's broken two more major stories about the NSA. NSA. On Friday, he exposed how President Obama ordered his senior national security and intelligence officials to draw up a list of potential overseas targets for U.S. cyber attacks. Then Greenwald revealed details about an NSA data mining tool called Boundless Informant that details and even maps by country the voluminous amount of information it collects from computer and telephone networks. A top-secret NSA global heat map shows in March 2013 the agency collected 97 billion pieces of intelligence from from computer networks worldwide. The NSA most frequently targeted Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Egypt and India. The Boundless Informant documents also showed the agency collected more than 3 billion pieces of intelligence from U.S. computer networks over a 30-day period ending March 2013. Glenn, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, a lot has happened this weekend. Uh, Edward Snowden has come out. We've just aired the interview that you did with him. A uh, talk about the significance of this series of exposés that you're continuing from Hong Kong? The primary point that I think needs to be made from all of these stories, and particularly from the very courageous outing, self-outing of Ed Snowden, is that there is this massive surveillance apparatus that is being gradually constructed in the United States that already has extremely invasive capabilities to monitor and store the communications and other forms of behavior, not just of tens of millions of Americans, but of hundreds of millions, probably billions of people around the globe. And, and it's one thing to say that we want the United States government to have these capabilities. It's another thing to allow this to be assembled without any public knowledge, without any public debate, and with no real accountability. And, and what ultimately drove him forward and what ultimately is driving our, our reporting and will continue to drive our reporting is the need for light to be shined on what this incredibly consequential world is all about and the impact that it's having both on our country and our planet. On Saturday, U.S. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper criticized the leaks. It is uh, literally, uh, not figuratively, literally gut-wrenching to see this happen uh, because of the huge, grave damage it does to our uh, intelligence capabilities. And, of course, for me, this is a, a key tool for pre preserving and protecting the nation's safety and security. So uh, every one of us in the intelligence community, most pati particularly the, the great men and women of NSA, are very are profoundly affected by this. Glenn Greenwald, your response.
This is just the same playbook that U.S. government officials have been using for the last five decades. Whenever anything gets done that brings small amounts of transparency to the bad conduct that they do in the dark, they immediately accuse those who brought that transparency of jeopardizing national security. They try and scare the American public into believing that they've been placed at risk and that the only way they can stay safe is to trust the people in power to do whatever it is they want to do without any kinds of constraints, accountability, or light of any kind. This has been going on since Daniel Ellsberg, who now is considered a hero, but back then was accused by the clappers of the world of being a traitor who jeopardized national security and put the lives of men and women in American uniform in harm's way. The reality is that if you look at what it is that we disclose, we disclose things like the fact that the U.S., the National Security Agency, is collecting the telephone records of millions of Americans without regard to any wrongdoing, or that they're tapping into the, the, the servers of the largest internet companies that people around the world use to communicate with one another. There, it is inconceivable. There's just no rational, sane argument that one can make that anything that we disclosed in any way alerts the terrorists who all knew already for many years that the government is trying to monitor them, or in any way enabled attacks to be done on the United States. The only thing that we exposed is the wrongdoing of these political officials, and the only thing that has been damaged is their reputation and credibility. Top secret designations are more often than not used to protect the political officials from no, having known what they're what they are doing in the eyes of the American people, not protecting national security. And that's certainly the case of the stories that we published. Glenn Greenwald, can you tell us more about Edward Snowden, why he came forward, what he risks, and why even you both are in Hong Kong, why he chose Hong Kong? It's really one of the most remarkable experiences I've ever had meeting him and having interviewed him for um, several months now, really, and, and for the last eight days in person here in Hong Kong. And I say that because he has undertaken actions that he knows are going to result in serious harm to his personal interest and to his well-being, whether that means that he will never see his home again or he will, he will spend many decades or the rest of his life in a cage or will be passed around from government to government. Um, in the, in the short term, he knows his life has been turned upside down, and he knew that when he did it. And there are all kinds of ways that he could have personally benefited from this information. If he had wanted to get rich, he could have sold it to all sorts of intelligence agencies. If he wanted to harm the United States, he could have dumped it indiscriminately on the Internet or passed it to U.S. enemies and uncovered all sorts of covert operations and covert agents. He chose to do none of that. He did something that doesn't really benefit him at all. It just benefits the public. It benefits the rest of us, because we learn what our government is doing and how our world is being affected by it. And yet he did that knowing that he would be put into that situation, and he never betrayed when he talked to us any degree of fear about it. He was worried about what would happen. He was tense about getting about having seeing what was going to happen, but he never had any regret. He had made his choice, and he was very at peace with it because he knew that it was the right thing. As far as coming to Hong Kong, um, the main reason that he did that was because he has watched over the past four years as the U.S. government under President Obama has prosecuted whistleblowers more aggressively and more prolifically than any other prior administration in American history by far. And he's watched as the trial of Bradley Manning that is now underway takes place in extreme amounts of secrecy, very little transparency, hardcore fundamental abridgments of due process. And he knew that if he stayed in the United States, he was going to be subjected to exactly that treatment. And so he came to a place where he believed that the political values that prevailed were ones that he found amenable, that there's lots of robust free speech and political dissent, but also he believed that he was coming to a place where the government would not instantly succumb to the demands of the American government when it came to what was done to him, but instead would assert its own interest in principles of law, and, and he felt like this was the ideal place for that. Talk about the significance of who he worked for, Booz Allen Hamilton, that he had worked um, at the Central Intelligence Agency and then for several contractors that work within the National Security Agency. Right. So he was never actually directly employed, as you say, by the NSA. He was directly employed by the CIA, 
where he was stationed with diplomatic cover in Geneva, Switzerland, for roughly two and a half years in this 2007, 2008, 2009 time frame. Both prior to that and then after that, he was employed by a multitude of private contractors, including Booz Allen and the Dell Corporation, where he would be essentially tasked to the NSA. So even though he wasn't working directly for the NSA, technically that wasn't his employer. He went into the office of the NSA every day. He took orders and, and got instructions from supervisors of the NSA. What this really shows is this incredibly interlinked world between private corporations and our most powerful and secretive intelligence agencies. It's all been privatized, or the great bulk of it has been privatized. There's immense amounts of profit made on it. And it's all the more reason to be concerned when these extreme surveillance capabilities are vested in these agencies, because it isn't just the public government officials who control it, but also these private agencies that play a very substantial role in how it operates. And, and Booz Allen, in particular, is one of the largest and most significant defense contractors. One of the primary officials of it is General Michael McConnell, who was the director of national intelligence under George Bush. And it's the kind of prototypical defense contractor where, when there's a Republican administration, Booz Allen executives go and fill the security positions, and those of the, the prior officials go and fill the executive slots at Booz Allen, and then it reverses when a Democrat comes into play. It's one of the most significant and most influential uh, defense contractors in in the world. And uh, the fact that he, he worked for them, I think, is going to create a lot of problems for them. And McConnell's tie to total information awareness. I mean, 10 years ago, the country was up in arms about the possibility that Americans would be spied on. And so um, it, it was killed, supposedly, TIA, total information awareness. And McConnell's linked to that. Right. And, and what's fascinating about that was that that took place in, in late 2002, 2003, when it was revealed that the Pentagon was planning this total information awareness program. It was actually being run by John Poindexter, who was the former national security advisor to President Reagan, who resigned in disgrace and almost went to prison over the Iran-Contra scandal. And what was amazing about that was that there, there was great public uproar, as you say, even in the early stages after 9-11, when the public, the media, the Congress were extremely subservient to whatever the government wanted to do. But that was just a bridge too far, even then. And yet, with these revelations, the ones that we published thus far and the ones that we'll continue to be publishing in the future, what they really illustrate is exactly what you said, which is that they don't call it total information awareness anymore. That was a little bit too honest of a term. That was probably the main reason why it created such uproar, because it was just too too naked clear what it was intending to, to, to accomplish. But what the NSA is doing, not just domestically, but globally, is creating a total information awareness system. The last story that we published, as you said, was a program, a, a mining data mining uh, program called Boundless Informant. Boundless Informant. That is what the NSA is about, is eroding all vestiges of privacy in the world and ensuring that they have full and unfettered monitoring ability to all forms of human behavior. And this is ultimately why he came forward because he said in good conscience he couldn't allow that to be done in secrecy. If the public wants that to happen, so be it. But we need they need to be informed that it's happening and then have a public debate about it. Glenn Greenwald, I want to go back to what Edward Snowden said. Any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything. But I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. Okay. Edward Snowden is a 29-year-old contractor with uh, Booz Allen. Um, he was working in Hawaii, and he said he could wiretap any of these people. Explain how that is possible, Glenn Greenwald, just to make this very clear and plain language for people all over this country and around the world. Uh, 
the NSA sucks up into its systems billions and billions of communication activities every week. Billions and billions. In fact, the data mining documents that we published reflect that it, it, it sucks up 90 billion in a 30-day period, including 3 billion in the United States. The Washington Post three years ago told us that every single day the NSA collects and stores 1.7 billion emails and telephone calls by and among Americans. Their argument is that we may suck it up, we may store it, we may monitor it, but the law says we can't actually listen to it or read it if it's by and between Americans without first going to a FISA court. And what Edward Snowden is, is telling you is that, although that might be the law, the monitors, the, 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 the systems at NSA allow full and unfettered access at any time to any one of these analysts to go and listen to whatever it is they want, to read whatever emails they want, to monitor in real time whatever online chats are taking place. And because there's no oversight, because there's really no accountability or transparency, there's no check on this abuse. And we know for certain we should have learned the lesson 35 years ago when the, the church committee documented it, that when human beings are able to spy on other human beings in the dark, abuse, rampant abuse is inevitable. That was supposed to be why we don't have spying abilities without accountability any longer. But as, as Mr. Snowden is, is documenting to us, that's exactly what we have. And that's why it's so menacing. We're going to go to break, then come back to Green, Glenn Greenwald, who's in Hong Kong right now, as he continues to this series of explosive revelations about the, what the National Security Agency is doing. Um, but before we go to break, we understand that Edward Snowden has checked out of the hotel he's been in for the last weeks. Glenn, do you know where he is? I do, although I'm not going to share that with anybody. We're going to go back uh, to Glenn Greenwald in just a minute. We'll also be joined by William Binney, who left the National Security Agency right after 9-11 because he was so deeply concerned about the level of surveillance of Americans that the NSA was engaging in. Stay with us. Pink Floyd, welcome to the machine. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our coverage of the National Security Agency, we are speaking to Glenn Greenwald, who has um, been releasing this remarkable series of exposés based on Edward Snowden getting this do these documents uh, from the National Security Agency. We're joined now by former senior NSA official William Binney as well, who is a senior NSA crypto mathematician 
Ocean, uh, largely responsible for automating the agency's worldwide eavesdropping network. One of the two co-founders of the agency's Signals Intelligence Automation Research Center resigned after the September 11th attacks, deeply concerned about the level of surveillance. Um, Glenn Greenwald, again, still with us, who's broken the series. Um, uh, Glenn, before we go to William Benny, can you talk about the latest revelation about um, the cyber attacks um, that was your most recent expose? Sure. I mean, I, you know, we read this document and it was somewhat remarkable because it set forth this very aggressive policy whereby the United States could wage what the document itself called a vet offensive cyber warfare against any other entity or any other nation in the world simply in the event that it advances U.S. interests. Not if we're being attacked, not if it was necessary to prevent an imminent attack, but simply if in the judgment of the president or various members of his cabinet, including the Defense Department, it was in the judgment of them that, that doing so would advance national interest, they had the right to wage cyber warfare. And the Pentagon had declared cyber warfare as an act of war, which is a really aggressive war doctrine that the president codified. It also talked about cyber operations used domestically inside of the United States. There were no planning details, no, no uh, blueprints for how these attacks would be waged. So there was nothing harmful about publishing it, but it was an extraordinary policy that had been secretly adopted by the president with no debate. And we believe debate was warranted in, and we therefore published it. Uh, there is a great irony in Snowden revealing his identity from Hong Kong. Uh, President Obama at the time wrapping up a two-day summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping in California. The outgoing National Security Advisor Tom Donlan said Obama confronted uh, Xi uh, on U.S. allegations of China-based uh, cyber piracy. Glenn. Right. Well, that was one of the main reasons why we published the article is because the Obama administration has spent three years now running around the world warning about the dangers of cyber attacks and cyber warfare coming from other nations like China, like Iran, like other places. And what is unbelievably clear is that it is the United States itself that is far and away the most prolific and the most aggressive perpetrator of exactly those cyber attacks that President Obama claims to find so alarming. And as you say, we published the story on the eve of his conference with the president of China, in which uh, the, the top agenda item, because of the United States' insistence, was their complaints about Chinese cyber attacks and, and hacking. And it just shows the rancid, fundamental hypocrisy of the statements the United States makes, not just to the world, but to its own people about these crucial matters. I want to bring William Binney into the conversation as well. Uh, William Binney, you quit after almost 40 years at the NSA, um, deeply involved in developing the whole surveillance mechanism, and yet you quit over it as well. Your response to these series of revelations? Well, it's certainly an extension of what I've been trying to say, that we were on a slippery slope to a totalitarian state. And that, that was simply based on the idea that the government was collecting so much information about all the citizens inside the country that it gave them so much power they could target people in the, for example, use, it, use the knowledge to, to collectively assemble all of the people participating in the Tea Party, target them, and, and do, uh, they could even do active attack on them with uh, going across the network, taking material out of their computers. So it was a very dangerous situation in my mind. It still is. Uh, William Benny, when you quit um, over a decade ago, would you ever think it would get to this point, or were we at this point a decade ago as well? Uh, actually, it's it started about then. I mean, certainly 2003 was important because of— uh, all of the nearest devices they were putting in other equipment that would allow them to take whatever was on the optical fiber network inside the United States, they deployed those and started collecting all that material. So that became, that was content coming in. Emails, uh, voice over IP, all of that kind of material was coming in and being stored. And then uh, before that, starting right after 9-11, they started pulling in all of the call records which, by the way, some of the numbers everybody's talking about are pretty low. They're just too low. The call records that I estimated would have been on the order of three billion a day. Now, it doesn't mean that they're, they're transcribing the, what's being said on the phone calls. They're just recording the fact that they occurred. They're using a target list, I'm sure, to target people who are 
who they want to record and transcribe. And that list is provided to the switch networks, and whenever the switches detect them, they route those audios, that audio to recorders, and then it gets recorded, stored, and put in a priority list, and the transcribers go through that and transcribe it. I want to return to remarks made over the weekend by Director of National Intelligence James Clapper in an interview with NBC. He said the leaks would aid enemies of the United States. While we're having this uh, debate, discussion, and all this media explosion, uh, which of course supports transparency, which is a great thing in this country, but that same transparency has a double-edged sword, in that our adversaries, whether nation-state adversaries or nefarious groups, benefit from that same transparency. So as we speak, they are going to school and learning how we do this. And so that's why it potentially has can, uh, can render great damage to our intelligence capabilities. William Benny, can you respond to the director of national intelligence, James Clapper? And then I want to ask Glenn to do the same. Sure. In my mind, that's a red herring. I mean, it's, a, it's a, just a false issue. The point was uh, the terrorists have already known that we've been doing this for years. So there's, there's no surprise there. They're not going to change what, the way they operate just because the, it comes out in the U.S. press. I mean, the point is they already knew it, and they were operating the way they would operate anyway. So uh, the point is that they're not, we're not the, the government here is not trying to protect it from the terrorists. It's trying to protect it, that knowledge of that program from the citizens of the United States. That's where I see it. And Glenn Greenwald, I mean, this, of course, is the debate that's going on in all of the networks right now, is uh, that you're compromising national security uh, by publishing what uh, Edward Snowden has given to you, and, of course, that Edward Snowden is not a whistleblower, but a threat to national security, they are saying. If you could also comment, Glenn, after you respond to that, on the fact that Edward Snowden did not want everything released that he had uh, access to, that he was careful, for example, not to release the um, location of CIA stations and, and other information? The, the, the claim that, that the director um, is making is, is so ludicrous that I'm surprised he can get it out with a straight face. It really ought to insult the—it does insult the intelligence of every single person to whom he's directing it. The idea that there are any terrorists in the world who pose any real threat who aren't aware or who weren't aware until our articles appeared last week that the United States government tries to monitor their communications and listen in on their telephone calls and read their emails— any terrorist who is unaware of the fact that the U.S. government was doing that is a terrorist who is incapable of even writing their own name, let alone detonating a bomb inside the United States. Exactly as Mr. Binney said, their only concern is it has nothing to do with terrorism. They're not trying to keep any of this from the terrorists. They're trying to keep it from um, the American people. And, and, and that's the point. And, and as far as the documents are concerned— he had access to enormous sums of top-secret documents that would be incredibly harmful. He went through and turned over only a small portion of those documents to us, all of which he read very carefully. And I know that not only because he told me that, but also because the way we got the documents was in extremely detailed folders, all divided by content, that you could have only organized them and had you carefully read them. And when he gave them to us, he said, look, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a high-level government official. I am not saying that everything I gave you should be published. I don't want it all to be published. I want you as journalists to go through it and decide what is in the public interest and what will not cause a lot of harm. He invited, in fact, urged us to exercise exactly the kind of journalistic judgment that we have exercised. And so had it been his intention to harm the United States, he could have just uploaded all these documents to the Internet um, or found the most damaging ones and, and caused them to be published. He did the opposite. The NSA and, and the rest of the country owe him a huge debt of gratitude for all of the work he's done to inform the American public without bringing about any harm to them. To say the least, he understands the stakes right now. I mean, this is the first week of the Bradley Manning trial, who faces uh, life in prison, possibly death, for releasing documents to WikiLeaks on trial at Fort Meade, uh, actually the headquarters of NSA, Glenn Greenwald. And William Benny, if you could give a final comment on this. Who should go first? Uh, go ahead, Bill Well, Benny. this is why I find it so incredibly no, courageous to watch what he did, because he knows— 
So, because he knows exactly how the government treats whistleblowers, and yet he went forward and did it anyway. And what I really hope is that his courage is contagious, that people get inspired by his example, as I have been, and decide that they ought to demand that their rights not be abridged and that they have the full authority to stand up to the United States government without being afraid. Will there be more exposés, Glenn Greenwald, that we can expect from you at The Guardian? Yes, there will definitely be more exposés that you can expect from me in The Guardian. And Bill Binney, very quickly, 10 seconds. Uh, well, I'm sure, I mean, he, it was a constant decision that he made to, to do what he did. Um, and of course, uh, the government's going to try to get him. And he knew